This is going to be a very different talk. Uh, you've heard a lot about um, all the uh, transcatheter valves. I'm going to talk a bit about that, but my title is Three-Dimensional Echo is Key. Uh, I was v v so very interested in these talks because I rarely saw a three-dimensional echo picture. So maybe it's not so important. Uh, but but um, I've sort of modified my title a bit, and I've changed it a bit to going a step further than three-dimensional echo. When we started this business of imaging with ultrasound, we were back in the days of M-mode, and here's an M-mode echo that you can see. This is one that I did in, I believe it's 1972, where I took the transducer and swept from the aorta into the mitral valve. And we did this all the time. And it was to try to create some concept of space. What is space? Uh, and I've got a real problem here because uh, I see my slides are totally out of order for some reason. Uh, so let me just end the show see if I can go back, which I probably can't. This is going to be a total modification of a talk uh, online. So, uh, how this happened, I do not know. Uh, we're going to, going to talk about, uh, about about changing things. And changing things means we will go next to very high speed. I was going to show you pictures of the M mode and then the first two dimensional images and how terrible they were. And then I was going to show you the first three dimensional images and how terrible they were. And then I would show you some modern ones, which you would have been excited and said, oh, they're really nice. And then I would have shown you a case because many of you are talking out there now about getting into trouble with all these valve designs. A design of this and a design of that. Getting into problems with heart block and the conducting system. And let me make this rapid transition. And the rapid transition is into the fact that we will be using these same techniques now to image the conducting system. So when you use TAVRs and you use reconstructive techniques on tricuspid valves, where you're very close to the conducting system, you will be able to see the conducting system. And this will be a part, I believe, of every transcatheter valve implantation or procedure or modification that exists. You wonder why I have a picture of a golf ball up here. <laughs> I'll unravel the mystery. What we need to do is image very fast, very fast. If we can image very fast, then we ought to be able to see micro contractions of the heart. And in fact, the golf ball is the example. If you looked at it at normal speed, you'd just see the golf ball looks like a golf ball. But when you look at it in high speed, you see this incredible deformity. Now, this has led to great designs in golf balls. But what we need to do is to think about how we can use the same concept to image the heart very rapidly. And if we could image the heart very rapidly, then we can see, uh, actually, the conducting system. I should remind you that the conducting system starts out embryologically as myocytes. Therefore, the conducting system actually moves and can contract. And if we look here at 50, uh, uh, so these should be at 50 frames per second. I've slowed the image down. You see an apical four chamber at 50 frames per second. And then when we look at the one on the right, now imaged at 430 frames per second, look at the septum. Do you see the little oscillations? You see these little movements going on? They are likely the conducting system. Now, let me remind you, too, 
430 frames per second is imaging the heart at every two milliseconds. And if you can image the heart every two milliseconds, you ought to be able to see movements that are impossible to see uh, uh, at standard imaging rates. Well, I bring you new machines. My interest has always been in the development of new instrumentation. Then let other people find ways of using this. This is a machine, and it's called the Duke T5 system, which means our fifth generation machine. It's kind of crazy, it's big, it's large, but it images very fast. We can image now up to 2,000 frames of second, or per second, which is every half millisecond. We can see m m many things we've never seen before. So this is the transducer that's used. Don't laugh. But everything has to begin small. So if you look at this picture, which is imaged roughly at two to 300 frames per second, watch the septum. The wall may not be moving, but you'll see things moving within the wall, inside the wall. We're not sure what that is. One possibility is the conducting system. The other possibility, which I'll describe to you, might be flow. Here's another crazy picture, but this is what we call a subtraction image, where we've subtracted one image from the other. When things light up white, that means something's changed. If it's still black, nothing is moved. But watch the septum there. This is a parasternal long axis. Watch the septum light up. You can see it, things light up going down the septum. And if we track those over time, we'd be able to see and map these. Now, just as another reminder, what we can do, I always look to do new things, new things that we never thought of doing before. I have an example of a dog here. This is a dog trying to drink from a bowl. I've always wondered how a dog could drink from a bowl and get the water uh, into their mouths. And when you go to high-speed imaging, you'll see how a dog does this. They curl their tongue. Some breeds curl their tongue down. Some bre breeds curl their tongue up. Well, in doing high-speed images, we stumbled upon some things. On the left is an image of, a, of an artery uh, imaged at 700 frames per second. On the right is the same identical picture, the same identical picture, except in that one, we use frame subtraction. And you can see the flow spring out of the picture. This is not adding contrast. This is not adding anything. It's just imaging in a very different way and at high speeds. Look at other things in flow imaging now. On the left is standard color flow. On the right is speckle tracked flow. You see these little lines. These are little vectors of flow. Now that image may not excite you very much, but if you slow this image down, you see very interesting things you see the flow gather underneath that aortic valve, and then when the aortic valve uh, opens, the flow comes out. Watch this, which are serial single frames. And if you look at the one on the left, there is no flow. Then the second one, the third one, you see the vector flow start up. And then if you look at the one on like the third one from the left, you see the flow in systole line up, getting ready to eject out of the ventricle and go directly into the right coronary artery in diastole. It's as if the ventricle, the aortic valve, and the flow know prior to diastole that the flow is going to go into the coronaries. And I see all these new tavers and things like that where you're worried about the coronary flow. I firmly believe you'll be able to see where the flow goes prior, and you'll be able to select your valve prior at the time, whatever valve that you need to accommodate to the coronary flow. You'll be able to image here at very high speed on the left, 
subtraction images on the right, now selected for diastole, where you see the septum light up. This is coronary perfusion. We'll be able to image perfusion. It gets even more complex than this. Trying to image, do we see the coronary flow? And these images will be very complex. We look at a pacemaker tip. Here a pacemaker tip is inserted in the right ventricle near the apex. And when we do this now, we can do lots of strain mapping and what moves first. Now you see apex at the bottom. All those curves just mean when does the wall move? This is done at extremely high speed. And if you look at the movement here with the pacemaker turned off, the movement is down the septum. When you turn the pacemaker on, you can see the movement up from the apex up. Well, we all know that pacemakers can cause lots of different problems. In CRT, we don't have all the answers. Here's a patient, so where the right ventricular pacemaker is in the center of the septum. This is a CRT patient that did not do very well. Here's a similar kind of imaging. Here, you see the crazy curves. But when we turn the pacemaker off, we see the waves come up. We don't know why it's coming up with the pacemaker turned off. And here, when we turn the pacemaker on, we see some very strange phenomenon. We see the collision of waves. The collision of waves not only coming from the AV node down, but from the pacemaker up, we have no idea what's happening. But what this says is we'll see new things. I look back at the day before we, in, so we did a, a, a then two-dimensional echo. I look back at the day when I was a student just examining patients, trying to learn physical diagnosis. I was amazed when I first held the transducer in my hand and could see inside the heart. Can you imagine the days before we could see inside? And now echo is just everywhere. There are other techniques too. We will see new things. Here's just a catheter inserted. This is an, an intravascular catheter. It's in the ventricle, done at very high speed. You can see it up against the septum, that very bright dot. And you can see the contractions we have mapped. Actually, this is a PVC. We're able to map the origin of PVCs now. If we can map the origin of PVCs, which we can, we can then map the conducting system. And if we can map the flows at high speed, we could see where the flows go and unravel these mysteries of how does flow in systole know where it's supposed to go in diastole. That just amazes me. Well, my last slide is a technical slide. It's highly technical. It was given to me by a colleague. This was uh, appeared, I believe, on German television. And you can see the, uh, the um, man here who is um, trying, to help his, trying to help his daughter. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. So, so trying to help his daughter in uh, in the kitchen. I'll bring the sound up. And the father is the grandfather is cutting. On a cutting board. Taking his iPad, using it for something that's totally different. All I can say is how amusing, look at the look on her face. We will see new things. I encourage you to look at Tavers and all these valves in a different way with all the new imaging techniques. Three-dimensional three echo is only a step along the way. There are so many new things, it will amaze you. I appreciate all your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Master lecture. We enjoy every minute of it. Thank you so much.